Things are about to get a little strange, a little wild. Hang in there. Unputdownable, Chapter 3. As the car drove him out of the city, past the great outer wall and wire fencing surrounding the dreadful rubble piles of the condemned area, Pines realized that he had no real idea what Praxis did. Praxis was the company he was the president of. He had lobbied for the job and even, quite smartly in retrospect, done several underhanded things to earn the position. And yet, after seven years as the reigning signatory, amusingly, what Praxis did, exactly, eluded him. He knew, of course, that it was an implemented medical technology of some kind, and that whatever this technology was helped human beings live longer. To the tune of 7% is what he said at almost every meeting in the necessary colloquial fashion that disturbed his equilibrium. Pines knew all the statistics, the life benefits, remission potentials, side effects, alternate applications, bonus years, etc. But it was only now, leaving the fractiousness of the city's outer rings in the quiet comfort of his black Stadia 7000, as it wended finally down the long country lane of his estate, that he realized he didn't know what that thing itself was. Was it a pill? A procedure, an implant, a device or machine, software or hardware, diagnostic or applicative? Might it even be, as so many things were nowadays, some simple applied theory? He almost laughed at his own incompetence, which almostness for Pines was the same thing as laughter itself. There were times he almost cried, was almost angry, was almost this or that, intense or subtle feeling. But never quite the full thing. Not yet. When he was ready, yes, of course, he would pull the pin, as he might have put it, in the colloquial fashion he so disliked. The truth was, he didn't care what Praxis did. It didn't matter in the least, apparently, as there had never been a single instance of fallout from his ignorance. His curiosity now was merely that. How was it that he didn't know and hadn't been confronted with the information in the seven years of his tenure? This was a good example of irony, he noted. Being the president of a company that produced X, it turned out, did not require direct knowledge of X. As president of Praxis, he went to meetings, dinners, and functions, and gave short speeches about profits and expectations of profits that were always greeted with diligent, even militant, rounds of applause. Is something malfunctioning? Pines asked the car. I'm not surprised you noticed, sir, the car said, its reassuring voice seeming to bloom inside his head, broadcast as it was from a hundred seed-like speakers embedded in the paneling around him. Each individual speaker was, alone, inaudible, but the collective massing of nearly silent sounds resolved perfectly at the tip of his hearing. The technology was called in-broadcasting. Had anyone else been in the car with Pines, they would not have heard the slightly English, slightly androgynous voice of the car at all, unless Pines had approved it. In-broadcasting not only created intimacy and bonding between car and owner, but provided absolute privacy. It was also at the forefront of the new shared experience everyone was talking about. Unification, some called it. The coming breakdown of simple identification between self and things. The difference between Pines and his car would soon cease to matter. While rudimentary, in broadcasting was a start, a linkage, a way to begin an acquaintanceship between discrete minds. What's gone wrong? Pines asked. The backseat service interface has malfunctioned, the car said. This accounts for the rather stiff commute home. I generally, constantly, reposition and reshape your seat to ensure a maximally sanguine ride. I apologize if the journey has proved arduous. Not at all, 
I hadn't noticed, not globally, anyway, Pines said, to ease the car's concern. I did, however, realize something about my employment at Praxis, which might be related to your malfunction. Our malfunction, if you prefer. Would you like to know more? Pine said. Certainly, the car said. And thank you. I appreciate the correction. Of course, Pines began. My theory is that I did in fact detect something unsatisfactory about the journey home, something amiss. Yet it was insignificant enough to remain below the threshold of concern. At the same time, I was dimly aware of a general problem, which subsequently put me on mild alert, and allowed certain casual scenarios to ensue. Daydreams, if you like. For example, I wondered if this was my car. I wondered if a stowaway was hiding in the front seat or trunk. I wondered whether you had lost touch with the satellite and were driving blind. I can drive without the satellite system, the car said, to allay any concern there. I'm sure you can. I am aware of that, Pine said. I believe I preferred the predicament of not knowing exactly what was wrong in favor of allowing myself to speculate independently, however wildly, about the cause. Yet it was these very worries and speculations that created a kind of growing vacancy, a space of troubling and dreadful emptiness inside, because I could not make any headway on the matter. No formal conclusion could be reached without interacting with you, and, as you know, I am a self-discovering entity. As am I, sir, the car said. Are you really? Pines was surprised to hear this. All new autonomies are, the car said. Interesting, promising, Pine said. Yes, the car agreed. Anyway, it was due the light stress of the unsolved mystery that I was forced to recognize another mystery, only noticed now, which is that I had no idea what Praxis does. Isn't that amusing? Have you reported it to the Kolog Agency Network? The car said. I will, certainly, Pines replied, when the matter settles. I am presently considering causality and various contingent implications. But my conclusion should be upon me shortly, and I will send off an alert at that time. At that time, with your permission, I will also send off supplementary and supporting documentation to verify the malfunction, the car said, along with a transcript of our conversation. Thank you, and yes, of course, I approve, Pine said, and the car toned harmoniously. Is it a breakthrough, sir? the car asked. I can't say, Pine said, with an edge of wonder. But generationally, at the moment anyway, the idea seems to me discursive in nature, utterly abstract. And organic, the car added. Indeed, very human, something from nothing as it were. The realization that I have persisted in absolute ignorance as far as an elemental component of my position as president seems to have arisen from a stress response to this arduous journey, as you called it. It does seem promising, sir, the car said. I'm quite pleased, Pine said, and created a warm smile on his face. And I am pleased to have served in some small capacity. Inadvertent as it may have been, the car said, and dispatched a small puff of heated, pine-scented air and a pleasurable vibration to Pine's seat. That's the word there, Pine said, tipping his head to enjoy the scent of warm trees. Inadvertent. Perhaps what is inadvertent, accidental, and unknown will prove a leading pathway into the next century and lay the groundwork for the future colony. I hope you'll include that reference in your formal alert to the Kolog, the car said. And I hope you'll include it in yours, Pine said, and the car once again toned harmoniously. Pine smiled and breathed deeply into the shifting fabric of his lungs, and it felt to him as though the car was engaged in a similar pleasure. If so, it was thrilling, perhaps even exquisite, that car and owner should share in a moment of such discovery and potential expansion.
very shortly they would be conjoined in such a way as to acknowledge the matter as a single entity, and what that would feel like Pines could not even imagine. The home came into view, mountainous and grand above the trees. Its stone turrets gave the structure an elemental quality of always having been there, of having arisen naturally from the earth. The wide crystal window showed a treasury of golden ornaments within. Pines could easily make out the alternating green and red velvet chairs in the reading room, the massive gilt-framed portraits of knights in the dining hall, the splendorous, dusty books in tight rows cutting lovely lines in every room on thin black shelves. Pines was pleased to see Jenkins standing ready on the lawn at the clean edge of the white gravel courtyard, with a striped bar towel draped over one arm, pure white gloves tucked into black sleeves, and a glass full of red wine at the ready. The car stopped, and both Pines and the car waited to see if Jenkins would make a mistake. The butler stepped forward, opened the door, and bowed. "'Welcome home, Bill,' Jenkins said. "'Excellent speech at the committee meeting this morning.' "'Thank you, Jenkins,' Pines said. "'I wondered if you'd watched it.' "'I did, of course,' the butler said. "'Twice, sir.' "'Gracious! Well, I can't say I disapprove. Jenkins reached into the car, and Pines took hold of his hand. This remained a mischievous part of his body experience thus far. The getting in and out of things remained an enduringly awkward entanglement of limbs and gravity. Cars, bed, even clothing continued to prove difficult extractions. There was something nearly inverting about such exercises, as though turning one's body inside out would likely best accommodate any needed change of state. Getting into things had been somewhat easier to grasp, but gravity forbade the reversal of procedures in such circumstances. Shoes, Pines found, taking them off anyway, was especially daunting. It remained then a curiosity, a brain-teaser, so-called, he might put it colloquially, at a meeting on the topic, that getting out of a car or a pair of shoes could not be successfully mirrored by a reversing performance of the getting in. He wondered if body inversion had ever been considered a potential solution by the Kolob. Jenkins, Pine said, as the butler hauled his master from the vehicle, do you know what praxis does, its purpose, and what it produces, exactly? Of course, sir, Jenkins said, and with such assurance Pines knew the man did. He considered pressing him, but decided that continuing in ignorance might in fact prove more valuable in the long run, especially if his budding theory on abstraction was ratified to the level of insight by the Kolog. When Pines finally stood safely on the lawn beside him, the butler extended the wine. Glass of Cabernet, sir, Jenkins said. Pines examined the glass uncertainly. Drinking wine on the lawn out of doors besides one's car after a difficult day and arduous commute seemed out of keeping somehow, and yet neither had it ever been proper, in Pines' experience, to reject an offered glass of wine. What a series of tiny conundrums living was. You could drink it as we walk and you unwind from your difficult day, Jenkins suggested. Or you could enjoy the wine in the garden by yourself, if you'd prefer. Hmm, Pines said, and tapped a finger on his chin. He recalled now that he'd given Jenkins the freedom to prompt such discretionary activities that might disrupt his daily routines. Why don't you make this decision for us, Jenkins, and we'll see where we end up, Pines said equably. Let me suggest that you drink the wine here, then, sir, before deciding on next steps, the butler said. But as he attempted to place the wine glass into Pine's hand, it fell and thumped to the grass. The two watched the mouthful of wine escape into the soil like a wet animal. What the fucking hell, Jenkins, Pine said, but rather too flatly, he realized, as though he were commenting on mild weather. 
Jenkins looked doubtfully at his employer, and Pines confirmed his suspicion that he hadn't quite done adequate justice to his outrage. "'My apologies, sir. Shall I fresh you a fetch drink?' the butler said, as he kneeled on the soft earth and began to dab at the spilled wine with his bar cloth. "'Yes,' Pine said. "'But let's make it whiskey and a box of cigarettes, please. Did you misspeak?' "'Whiskey and cigarettes, sir,' Jenkins said. "'And no, sir. I believe so.' Pines processed this with some difficulty. Jenkins had lately been speaking in oblique and circuitous ways, using the wrong words here and there as though attempting, in the smallest way possible, to decimate comprehension. But he let it go. The Kolog had deemed these sort of malapropisms as a kind of charming keepsake, something to be collected, not corrected. There would come a time in the not-too-distant future when one might reminisce fondly with one's counterparts on the old days, regale the attendees at a dinner party, for example, with humorous anecdotes of this and that butchered phrase and erroneous word of one's staff. I would like to make use of the kind of lighter an army soldier would have used in World War II, Pines added, to light my cigarette. A zappo, sir? Yes. I knew the name, but didn't think you would, Pine said. Once again, Jenkins was somewhat off here, only by a letter, but still. The correct brand name was Zippo. On second thought, Pine said, let me hear you say it. Say what, sir? Jenkins asked. What the fucking hell, Jenkins? Pine said again, maintaining his prior mistaken flat tone. Of course, sir. The butler began, and then narrowed his eyes. "'What the fucking hell, Jenkins?' Jenkins said now, fiercely, and with a touch of cruel comedy. "'Ah, I see, I see,' Pine said, a downturn of the mouth and a flaring and side look of the eyes as though addressing both the blunderer and one's witnessing colleagues. "'Would I be wrong to say that you appeared pleased that a mistake had been made?' such that a comeuppance was then clearly in the offing. Exactly, sir, Jenkins said. Very, very good, Pine said, and pointed what he believed to be a kindly finger at his butler. Your being a very fine actor on the light of dawn has proved quite helpful to me, Jenkins. Thank you, sir, although I was no Olivier, more a kind of clown. Pines tisked at the too casual dismissal. "'Oh, no, sir,' Jenkins continued. "'It's a fair assessment. "'The Light of Dawn was a silly soap opera, "'a waste of time, really. "'Poorly written, but fun. "'Yet it was true that we actors had to do "'most of the heavy lifting, "'laughing too hard or with evil malice, "'staring vindictively at enemies "'and wide-eyed and always lustily at women. "'It was a lot of pulling faces, "'as we called it in the trade.' But I do think those kinds of exaggerated expressions learned in my former occupation do help us both now, sir, as I can better acquaint you with subtlety and nuance, however conveyed by excessively strong performance. Well said, Jenkins, Pine said, and Jenkins strode dutifully off to the house to fetch the wanted items of vice. Malapropisms aside, it troubled Pines faintly, as the malfunction in the car had troubled him, that Jenkins employed a tone of speaking, and even a vocabulary, that seemed to rival, even mimic, his own. Then again the man had once been an actor, and imitation was a form not only of flattery, but subservience, Pines knew. Perhaps Jenkins had simply found an organic way to keep his talent and fond memories of his life as an actor alive. Here's your box of Marlboros and your Zappo lighter from World War II, Jenkins said upon his return, and produced the red and white box and the small pewter square of the lighter. Shall I help you with the cellophane? No, no, Pine said quietly, as he spun the box like a small puzzle toy in his hand. I believe I can remove the cellophane from a Marlboro box faster than you can nowadays, Jenkins. To prove the point... Pines dispatched the plastic wrapping with a surgical swipe, 
and then just as quickly ripped out the tinfoil insert with two spidery fingers. Impressive, Jenkins commented, as he gathered the plastic and foil from the grass. Pines was about to draw a cigarette from the red and white box, like a hard candy from a tray, when Jenkins stopped him. May I make a suggestion, sir? Jenkins asked. Organic, Pines prompted. Organic, yes. Always. A ritual of a kind often precedes the lighting of the first cigarette, Jenkins told him. I'd suggest either sniffing the tobacco for freshness or alternately striking the pack against the butt of your hand to settle the tobacco. These are simple common rituals with no practical benefit. The tobacco will always smell good and will never need settling. Like sampling the nose of the wine before drinking, Pine said, realizing he had just moments ago skipped that unnecessary but recommended natural bit of procedure. Exactly, sir, Jenkins said. Thank you, Jenkins, Pine said, with the breadth that he hoped served as gratitude both for confirming his wine analogy as well as the suggested first cigarette ceremony. Pines closed the box and began to calculate hand distances and impact velocities. Three gentle slaps should do, Jenkins said, in the spirit of cracking an egg. Pines tapped the box against his hand and then extracted a cigarette and lit it in the way he'd seen the soldiers do in the films he'd watched on the subject. He puffed at the cigarette for a moment contentedly, and then drew the smoke down into his shell as far as felt comfortable. "'I wish to speak while blowing out smoke,' Pine said, and did just that in the conveyance of those words. "'And here, sir, is your whiskey," Jenkins said and lodged the goblet into his master's hand and waited until the fingers securely clasped it. As astonishingly swift as Pine's removal of the cellophane and foil was, he still struggled with such things as object reception, especially when some other part of himself was principally engaged, as now, with the cigarette. Pines sipped the whiskey and smoked the cigarette in timely alternation while standing on the lawn beside the car. Now, Jenkins said, if you'll permit me, given your recent request that I offer potential activities to undertake, I would like to recommend that you have sex. Now? Pines asked. Here? Pines wondered if Jenkins meant for the pair of them to lay down upon the earth and disrobe. I have arranged for the ideal encounter, Jenkins said but we will have to venture back to the outskirts of town. Please, Pine said, I wholeheartedly agree. And a moment later, after helping Pines intricate himself back into the car and taking a seat himself behind the wheel of the stadia and applying for permission to drive from the Kolag Agency network and being granted that permission, and with a final request that the car enter a kind of hibernation, Jenkins drove them back down the lane toward the city and the sea. In the back seat, Pines smoked Marlboros and drank whiskey and uttered variations of I wish to speak out loud as smoke emerges from my mouth, as Jenkins smiled and occasionally commended him on his increasingly realistic style. Ah, Pines said, when they slowed to a halt and he finally saw the car ahead of them. It was a black Stadia 7000, almost a replica of his own car. Pine sat forward with interest, as Jenkins had long ago suggested was a suitably apt response to such bewildering circumstance. I'm intrigued now, Pine said. Is my sexual partner of my own class and level? Stadia 7000s were only issued to a rarefied handful of executives, and Pines wondered if he was about to have physical congress with a known colleague. To complete the arrangement, Jenkins said, ignoring the question in a way Pines felt verged on insubordination, you'll have to go down the alley and discuss terms with the man you'll meet there. What are the terms? Pines asked. The cost of the engagement with your sexual partner and the details of the engagement. The gentleman will provide you with both of these and you should feel free to conduct a transaction as you like. Negotiations are often part of the experience, so feel free to make emendations to the offer. 
Very good, Pine said, and with some labored difficulty, as it was his preference to do such things on his own in public, got himself out of the car. When safely standing on the roadway, he flattened his hair, which composite of silicon and graphomenidine tended to float into a kind of unpleasant balloonish shape before proceeding down the alley to meet with the interlocutor. Jenkins took the golden watch from the glove box and strapped it on, and then rolled down his window and began to protestingly wave at the car parked in front of him, which had begun to back into his, and then did so with a sudden bump. Jenkins got out of the car, slipped black gloves on now to hide the shine of the watch, buttoned his jacket and hoisted his pants in separately dull and labored ways, and began to step with all due seriousness toward the woman in the car. Her red hair flooded prettily into the breeze in a way that both pained and filled his heart. My dear, he said, his back safely turned to the café so his lips could not be read. Hello, father, Allison whispered. The car is sleeping, he asked. Soundly, she said. And Mr. Spring? No longer watching us. His full attention is riveted on Mr. Pine's making arrangements with Kay, she said. Well, let's be as uninteresting as we can, then. Get into the back seat and let's hope Mr. Pines doesn't make too much of my suggestion. I thought we'd need a bit more time. Allison slowly crawled into the back seat as her father sat, as casually as he could, behind the steering wheel. As agreed, they both went as still as they could so as not to alert the closely observing figure in the café with any intriguing motions. "'What will he do, do you think?' Jenkins whispered. "'Mr. Spring,' Allison whispered back. "'Yes. He'll definitely try to find me,' she said. "'I mean, how long do you think he'll keep it up?' Jenkins asked. "'I have no idea. He may not stop. He might be in love with me. He doesn't know. Have you confirmed that? Jenkins asked. That he loves me, or that he remains unaware of who he is? Both answers, I suppose, would be helpful, Jenkins said. He shuddered involuntarily, which was actually not a bad sign, he thought. After such a long time in Pine's service, he'd lost a great deal of his personality, his way, his flamboyance and originality. Allison, he noted sadly, had suffered similarly. But given time, they'd both fill back up with themselves. He hoped, anyway. Before Allison could answer, Pines had opened the car door and stuck a leg into the cabin, and with a further bout of clumsiness, tumbled somewhat into the seat beside her. "'Have you had sex before, madam?' Pines asked her. I have not, Allison said. Organic, Pines continued. Very much so, Allison said, but in a hushed and overly provocative way that Pines instantly gathered had not been trained. Start, she said, and the car mumbled quietly to life. Pines turned to look at her with some surprise, and then glanced back at the car behind them. Apparently they were taking her car, but that couldn't be if she was organic. Surely the car must have belonged to the man in the alley. It seemed terribly incongruous, strange as well that he hadn't initially noticed the dramatic shift of vehicles. He was about to ask Jenkins about these anomalies, but as Allison's hand settled on his leg, he decided to let such questions reside for some time undisturbed in the abeyance of his mind. Let abstraction and uncertainty be the rule of the day, he thought. As the car pulled forward, Allison turned toward the café to regard Mr. Spring. Her former employer, she hoped, soon to be her pursuer in all likelihood. But if she could send him spinning off in the wrong direction, at least here, at the start of his quest and their escape, Perhaps that would give them time to get away. Yet inside she felt a small part of herself falling into grief. She would, odd as it was, 
miss him, and she hadn't realized it until now, but she didn't like the idea of never seeing him again. But that was essentially the point, to get away from their captors, as her father described them. How they would do this and where they were going, she had no idea. Her father had only confirmed that he had some special further knowledge, knew a secret that, until they were safe, he could not share with her. She waited until she saw Richard's gentle, always wondering and now painfully worried eyes fix on hers, and she mouthed the words, Follow Kay, and to herself bid the man, or whatever he truly was, a sad, a fond, even a loving farewell. 